Good evening, good evening. My name is Thad Zolkowski, and I am the deputy director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique institution which was founded in 2007 by the Leon Levy Foundation and Shelby White. We are, as always, keen to express our gratitude to Shelby. It's her vision that makes this uh, program possible. So in, on April 16th, we have an event coming up with uh, Natalie Dykstra, who's going to be talking about her biography of Isabella Stewart Gardner called Chasing Beauty with Rachel Cohen. And this is on April 16th uh, downstairs, co-sponsored by, by public programs. So mark your calendars for that, please. And you know you can register, it's free. All our events are free. But tonight we are delighted to welcome Benjamin Taylor, <clears throat> who is joined by Molly Haskell to discuss Chasing Bright Medusas, his biography of Willa Cather, which in the words of the New York Times, portrays Cather with the sort of swift, opinionated strokes she herself used to create her characters. Benjamin Taylor is the author of an excellent brief biography of Proust, along with two memoirs, uh, The Hue and Cry at Our House, and Here We Are, My Friendship with Philip Roth. He's also the author of Naples, Declared a Walk Around the Bay, and two novels, Tales Out of School, and the book of Getting Even. He is a past fellow and current trustee of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation and serves as president of the Albert Edward F. Albee Foundation. Molly Haskell is the author of six books, including From Reverence to Rape, The Treatment of Women in the Movies, and the memoir Love and Other Infectious Diseases. She won a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2010 and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the New York Film Critics Circle in 2018. Benjamin and Molly will discuss Cather and biography for about 45 minutes, and then open the discussion up to questions from the audience. I'll pass around a mic. Please welcome Molly Haskell and Benjamin Taylor. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Ben, for writing this fantastic book. Um, I don't know if probably most of you have read it, and you know how wonderful it is. Incidentally, I listen to it. I do a lot of audio books, and I listen to it, and Ben does the audio. He, do, he performs it, and he's wonderful. I mean, he's a, he's a practiced performer. Writers recording their own books is not always a good thing. I've listened to a few that really don't come off, but his is wonderful. Um, I don't know any, any writer, and you may, but I can't think of any just offhand whose reputation has sort of gone up and down. Is all, it's like a roller coaster, Willa Cather. You know, she's taught, I, I, I think I had my Antonia in the middle school, and then she wasn't taught for a while, and then she was. And then again, tell me about, about that, and also when you, when did you uh, come into contact with her and, and, and love her? Yes. Yeah, well, in the decade after she died, she died in the late 40s, uh, and uh, in the 50s, I think she was considered a dowdy writer and a minor regionalist, something like that. I looked in vain in the writings of Mary McCarthy and Elizabeth Hardwick for any mention of Willa Cather. She just was not a figure for them. Uh, and uh, uh, this all began to change with second wave feminism, uh, surely, uh, uh, one of the most important intellectual forces uh, of uh, the, the final quarter of the 20th century. And uh, uh, the reputation just grew and grew from there to uh, uh, its uh, uh, current preeminence, which I think she will maintain. Uh, people love these books. Uh, I, I see it in the faces of students when I assign them. Uh, I remember a girl, sure, I remember a girl uh, 
coming to class, we, the book was a lost lady, and she said, oh, this is the best novel I've ever read. Why hadn't I heard of this writer? Well, everybody's heard of Hemingway and Fitzgerald and Faulkner, of course. Uh, they were young enough to be Willa Gather's sons, but uh, they, uh, uh, they were precocious and she was not. She was in 40. She was in her 40th year by the time she arrived at, to public acclaim with uh, the first volume of the trilogy, uh, O Pioneers, and then uh, The Song of the Lark, and then My Antonia. Uh, and, and she had the, uh, the, the approval, strong approval of the great critics of the time, above all H.L. Mencken, uh, well, did you supporter. did you first encounter her as an adolescent, and, and did you love her immediately? Or, yeah. Well, actually, it was sixth grade. My sixth grade teacher, Mrs. Westbrook, recommended we, we would go to the library, the school library, once a week mm. and check out a book. And she said, I have the book for you. Uh, uh, mostly, I recommend it to the girls, but it, since it's told by a boy, I think you will enjoy it. So I don't know what I got out of uh, uh, such a a complex and yeah. highly sophisticated book uh, when I was 11 years old, but I read it anyhow. It's true that it, in a way it's really not for children, yet somehow it, it was being taught to, to, to sixth graders, you know. Yeah. There are certain books that are good to read when you're a kid and yeah. then again, again when you're an adult. Again, and you see it completely different. Yes. Um, well, in another, ben and I, in another context, are reading Edith Wharton, and the, 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 the two writers couldn't be more different. I mean, different milieu, different writing, although they're only like a decade apart. I think Wharton was 10 years older than Willa Cather. As Ben says, Willa Cather got started late. But, I mean, some, something occurred to me that they have in common, aside from genius and guts, is that both of them were uprooted early. I mean, Wharton was taken to Europe when she was just a child and for a long time. And, of course, Cather went to Nebraska when she was what, 10 or 12 years old. Eight, eight. And, and what this does, I think, I mean, because normally you, you sort of, you're born into a world and you have an automatic sense of it and you're belonging in it and, and that's the way it's going to be. And if you're suddenly taken out of that world, I mean, it really does open you up. It really changes you. you you're then more able to sort of chart your own course in a way. And that's what she did. And you have a, a wonderful line, line about um, Red Cloud the seedbed of her imagination, and it granted her a kind of exposure she, ha she had not had in Shenandoah Valley. And like, like Wharton, they managed to not teach themselves, but find somebody. I mean, girls had no formal education then, and they managed to get someone to teach them languages. She had Latin and Greek. She, uh, yes, uh, uh, she, she found a cos cosmopolitanism in the yeah. unlikeliest place yeah. where there was this babel of strange languages, Czech and All these immigrants. Well, talk about languages. that a little bit. It was the Homestead Act. That, that, that was the great lure, yes. Yeah, for, and the family was For a nominal fee, you could have a hundred some odd acres yeah. and stake it out, and that's what her family had done. They were in, Shen in Shenandoah, Virginia. And uh, were yes, Rocky and finance. that first winter was very hard on her, these howling winters, like nothing she had experienced in the Shenandoah Valley. Yeah. And uh, she said that during that first year, the landscape and I had it out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and after that, she loved, she loved the adoptive yeah. landscape and she loved the, uh, um, uh, the opportunities. There was a, a druggist, I guess he was, uh, or an assistant in a druggist named Mr. Ducker, Drucker, who uh, uh, taught her Greek and Latin. Mm -hmm. And she had a, 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 this fascination with the immigrant populations on the plane. She said, I had the experience of being in, in an ethnic minority, mm -hmm. white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Right. The others were, were from cent East Central Europe, or they were from Scandinavia, or they were from uh, uh, French Canada, uh, um, yeah, French she could do Canada. different things. I mean, yes, yeah, she found she found all these mentors. She, I think, was a mail carrier for a while. I mean, she could do uh, yeah. the oddest kinds of jobs. She, she, she was going to be a doctor. She, she had this doc like Thea in, in Song of the Lock. She had this doctor that she went around with, and she watched him 
do a, a, Ampu an amputation. Ampu she was, as a child, she was present at the yeah. amputation of a boy's leg. Yes. Yeah, amazing, yeah. Um, I, I want to talk about that a little bit later, why she suddenly didn't be that. But you have this thing, you, you talk about uh, her younger contemporary, Hemingway Faulkner Fitzgerald, Dos Passos, and the difference was that, that her idealism about America was unironic. I think that's such, such a key thing in the difference in why she, I think it's part of why she hadn't been as appreciated as some of the others. She didn't have that kind of bleak view of the world or under, an underlying bleak view of the world. Except that, I'm talk about that, and also that she declared um, the world broke in two in 1922 or thereabouts. Yes. About well, I'll, I'll do the second one first. Yeah, okay. uh, uh, the, the, certainly, her career broke in two in 1922. I don't know about the whole world. Uh, I'm not, I've never been entirely sure what she meant by that. She was received into the uh, Episcopal Church in 1922 along with the rest of her family. They had been Baptists. And uh, uh, she had propounded a new. Why did they go into that because that becomes very important to her, like the Episcopalian is, doesn't does, it? Oh, I yeah. think the beauty of the liturgy was what uh -huh, drew, uh -huh. what drew her and yeah. them. And I think she was the dominant personality for the family oh, really? and led the led the way. Really, oh, that's yes. interesting. Yeah. Um, by 1922, certainly. Um, she had propounded a new aesthetic for herself, which she called the novel des meubles, the unfurnished novel. And the first example of an unfurnished novel was uh, something really novella-sized, A Lost Lady. And that was, uh, that was a great um, innovation for her, a great ar artistic discovery yeah. after the bulkiness of The Song of the Lark. Yeah. Uh, uh, she was ready uh, to throw a lot overboard, and yeah. she wrote uh, in uh, a more, well, what we would call minimalist yeah. fashion. Yeah, well, I want to get to that too, but um, oh, there's one passage that I, I, I think is so fascinating. Uh, let's see. Because one of the things I think about her is that um, there's something really, I, I was watching this a short film by Martha Coolidge about her grandmother. Martha Coolidge is about my age, and this was done a while back about her grandmother. And, oh gosh, okay, this is not easy to do. Um, I'll just quote it briefly. The grandmother is a very smart, crusty lady living in, in Massachusetts and talks about her past, which is the same, a little bit the same past. She's like maybe 10 years older than Cather, and it's still, you know, no cars. It's the same world, basically. And, wait, she says. Uh, oh, she says, I see on TV, people want to know what their life means to them and why they are. I never thought who I was. We just lived and had a good time living. We never went into this psychological investigation of our inner selves. I can't understand how people are so bound to know who they are and where they're going. And I think this was pretty much the attitude of most people, but not Willa Cather. And this is what I think is something modern about her, because, I mean, she would never use the word psychological or there's nothing psychoanalytical, and yet it's, it's about identity in the way that we sort of think of it now. And um, it's the, the, the scene where, yeah, it's a, where she has, it, she has, what, seven brothers and sisters, or six or seven? Seven. And they're all in one room, except she's the oldest, so she gets to have a room of her own, yes, as it were. Yes, she does. Yeah. And she talks about, there is this, or, uh, she's saying this, that even in harmonious families, there's this double life, the group life, which is the one we can observe in our neighbor's household, and underneath, and underneath another, secret and passionate and intense, which is the real life that stamps the faces and gives character to the voices of our friends. Yes. Like all the greatest novelists, she was uh, a, a student of inner life, yeah. an, an expert on inner lives and how inner and outer fit together uh, so seamlessly is, is the secret of the, of the great novel. When you think about, uh, well, um, on the, 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 the great psychological realists like Emily Bronte mm. or Tolstoy or Proust, mm. uh, uh, they know their characters better than their characters can know themselves. Right. And uh, uh, she f she's part of that tradition. But also the secret life of the writer, in a way, too. Yes. yes. And I think that's something she probably shared with Edith Wharton, and also being women. You know, it was sort of 
very hard to, to think of oneself as a writer. There were no role models. There was no path, foreordained path, or anything. That, to... I went into this wondering if she had any interest in the great moral cause of her time, which was votes for women. Yeah. None. No. None whatsoever. Uh, uh, she uh, didn't. She didn't strive to vote, and I don't think she voted after uh, after the Nineteenth Amendment came in. And. Uh, 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 it's, well, that's where the world split in two, right? That's, uh, yeah. The world split in two a little after that. <laughs> okay. uh, um, I don't. Uh, uh, it was uh, uh, she. She thought she, she thought very little of suffragists, from what I can gather. Is that just? I mean, was it just a? a I mean, because she. I mean, you can call her a feminist without. I mean, that's she was. It, even if she wouldn't have claimed the name, but in a sense, she was because. Yeah, she wouldn't have claimed that name. Wow. There's another name she would not have claimed, lesbian. Yeah, talk about that. Uh, well, you saw, say she has an andro I mean, she is androgynous in her, in her fiction, which not all writers are. And and she, androgynous she, in her imagination. In her imagination. In a way that, for example, Saul Bellow or Philip it, Roth are not uh, androgynous. But Proust is. And but Proust certainly Henry is. Henry James and, is. And oh, her, yes, yeah. supremely Henry yeah. James. Uh, yes. Well, she was... Uh, we'll talk about that. I she, mean, everybody uh, wants to know. About... Yes, she would be astonished to, to have learned that she was a, a lesbian, uh, she, but she was. Uh, she simply would not, never have used that word to describe herself. And uh, in these novels, uh, uh, sex is typically the prelude to very bad things. Very dire events occur because of sexual entanglement in novel after novel. Think of O Pioneers, for example. Think of Lucy Gayhart. Sex is fatal in these books. Sexual desire and My mortal uh, enemy. I think I mean. she she successfully kept it out of her life. There were two great loves. There was um, there was uh, first Isabel McClung. Uh, and then after Isabel went off and got married, there was Edith Lewis. And um, uh, these women were uh, a Boston marriage. In both cases, they were what people call a Boston marriage, uh, companionate. Uh, whether or not there was any sexual activity is uh, uh, unknown. Uh, and there's no sense trying to figure it out. Uh, uh, they did sleep, it seems, in the same bedroom. Uh -huh. Well, there were so many of those then, weren't there? I mean, especially oh, yes. of course, the Boston marriage is, uh, even has a name for it. But it, you, you just expected to see spinsters living together. It wasn't, it wasn't any big deal. And you didn't sort of think of it in sexual terms two, or erotic two terms. Two spinsters, uh, old maids, living together in order not to be alone aroused very little curiosity. Yeah. Although, well, this comes later when we're sort of going chronologically, but much later, when she goes, she hadn't been in, in, in Nebraska in a long time, and when her father's ailing, she does go back with Edith, and she's a little nervous because she knows that it might look odd, these two women together. That the connubial nature of, yeah, of the yeah. attachment would become too obvious yeah. to the family. Yeah. yeah. Yes, she was a. She was able to be more herself with, uh, with, for example, little Yehudi Menuhin, who was her great that comes friend. That later, but that's so interesting. Talk yes. about that a little bit. Uh, it was a case of a woman of a certain age and a, and a child becoming fast, How did they meet? fast friends. Well, she was in the musical world. She saw. She I, 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 Isabel knew the. Oh, Isabel. Okay. Knew yeah. the. Uh, the Menuhin family, uh -huh. and they lived on the west side, and Edith was on the east side, and little Yehudi would come over to Aunt Edith, uh, Aunt Willa's, as he called her, and um, uh, uh, go, go sledding with her or have lunch with her. It was, it, it's a very tender story. Yeah, and he was devoted to her. I mean, she, she, she meant a huge amount to oh, him. Yeah. Right? Oh, yes. Yeah. He said that he and his sisters used to walk around the reservoir. This will resonate for uh, several of you here uh, uh, who were reservoir walkers. Uh, uh, that was their, that was their, uh, they would meet uh, at the, what is that gate at, at about 90th? Oh yeah, it's where I go, but I've forgotten the name yes. of it. Yes, and, and walk around yeah. what is now the Jacqueline Onassis Reservoir. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to read, what did she say, um, that quote about when she talks about love. Love, um, I don't think I wrote it down, but it, it's just such a, what did she say, that the only, sat, this only it's, it's just never satisfactory. Um, oh, do you remember, um, well she wrote about it I guess in different ways, but uh, well, well just in any, 
And sex was obviously to be avoided at all costs, but even love was rarely satisfactory, and most of the, there aren't any, very few really satisfying love stories. Where, where does this grim view come from? Yeah, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's something solidly Victorian. But people yeah. had a lot of sex in the Victorian right, era. Right, right, yeah. Um, well, let me see. There's a, there's a story called Coming Aphrodite, which is uh, in which uh, sex play, plays the role of villain. And then there's another story some of you may have read called Paul's Case. And in Paul's Case, uh, a young man uh, 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 steals money and comes to New York to live the high life, checks into the Waldorf, the old Waldorf, which would have been right where the Empire State Building is now. Uh, ch ch yes, checks into the old Waldorf and uh, m blows a, a small fortune in stolen money. But he meets with another boy uh, who's down on a flying visit from Yale for the weekend. And uh, uh, it's very clear, though not spelled out, that these boys uh, have sex together. And it's not long before one of them I is dead. Uh, really, yeah. yeah, it's doom, doom. But it's not just sex. I mean, here's this passage. Uh, she's writing to a friend. It is a good thing to love, but, don't, but it don't pay to love that hard. It makes a fool and a dupe of you while you're at it, and then it must end sometime, and after it is taken from you, the hunger for it is terrible, terrible. Yeah, she had a... She a, doesn't want it because she's going to lose it. A, co a college-age yeah, crush uh, uh -huh. that she had, and then after, this was college in, at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, uh, and then she had the good fortune while in Pittsburgh working for a, a ladies' magazine there, what at the time would have been called a ladies' magazine. Uh, she meets Isabel McClung, and this is the great love of her life. Uh, uh, she's in they, New York at this point. She's in Pittsburgh. Oh, she's in Pittsburgh, right, yeah. Uh, Isabel McClung's father is a Pitch Pittsburgh judge. Right. And uh, um, they have a marvelous life together, living upstairs in, in Isabel's parents' house. Yeah. And the parents seem not to have been at all anxious about this. Um, Sisterly, sisterly. It's, uh, 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 there's, there's a mystery here, uh, uh, the mystery of people choosing not to know what is obvious. Right, uh, like denial. And, e and even, the, even the participants themselves not understanding who they were. But I'm quite convinced the word lesbian would never have no. passed her lips. No. Um, at, at some point, I think she, she, wants to, she thinks she wants to be a doctor. She's probably been, been a pretty good doctor. But then she, she writes for, I forget what her first, in Nebraska newspaper, whatever. Her first, and then she sees her byline, and that's the end of wanting to be a doctor. The, the, the whole project of being a physician perished in one day. One byline, Beca yeah. Yes, one byline. So talk about her journalism and her magazine writing. Yeah. What, what, what is it like? Yes, yeah. uh, she, she uh, wrote a paper on Thomas Carlyle and turned it into the teacher, and the teacher uh, without telling her, submitted it to the Nebraska State Journal, and the Nebraska State Journal ran it. Uh, once she saw her name in print, yeah. uh, that was the end of wanting to be a doctor. Yeah. She was a mean. She was she was very ferocious. Like I guess, like all young writers, she wanted to make her mark. So she was sort of extreme in her opinions, right? A, a lot of negative reviewing of show, uh, of uh, theatrical events that that came to. Uh, to Lincoln, uh, Lincoln was a division point on the railroad from Chicago to Denver, and uh, so she would go from Red Cloud to. I mean, uh, she well, she was already living in Lincoln. She was living in Lincoln then. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, and um, uh, and then uh, she got a job uh, in Pittsburgh and was in no time uh, writing under uh, various l ludicrous. Pseudonyms, including one Helen Delay. That's a good. Why did that's you a, do that? That's a good, uh, to fill out the the, the columns. Oh, uh, 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 they were in need of copy. Okay. Yeah. So she had alternate, uh, aka aliases. Then. Oh, plenty yeah. of them. 
Yes, and uh, so she was very productive. And then she came to the notice of a powerful man. Uh, you may not know his name, but he, in his day, he was a force. S. S. McClure, who founded McClure's magazine, and uh, it, it was the chief muckraking. Muckraking. Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln Stephen. Lincoln Stephens and others. Uh, I'm sorry. We had, we Ida had, Tarbell. They had good writers. And yeah. they had very good writers. And while she was there, she. Uh, uh, she solicited and got for the magazine uh, stories from Kipling and from uh, Galsworthy and uh, others, a distinguished list. Uh, she was very effective, and she was what they used to call in newsrooms a fireman. Just you, you had only to give her a topic and a word limit, and she was off. Wow. She could uh, uh, do all kinds of things. And, um, and what she really wanted was to be a full-time writer uh -huh. and... Uh, um, so this is the verbosity that will finally get sort of streamlined later on, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But yeah. she, she, was re she really put out a lot and of copy. She, she loved writing a negative. How about editing? How was she as an editor? Did she learn from that? Uh, I'm sure she did. Yeah. Uh, uh, she was very much her own editor. But edi she did that editor. too, didn't she? I noticed that the... Uh, uh, yes, yeah, she edited others, but I noticed that in the... Uh, uh, in her relations with Alfred Knopf, uh, he did very little editing. Mm -hmm. When she turned something in, it was yeah. ready to go. That's right. Yeah. She had a wonderful sense for the shapes. Uh, those of you who've read her know this, the shapes of things. Uh, uh, and these are, these are very shapely books. The Professor's House, A Lost Lady, uh, Death Comes for the Archbishop. She had a strong instinct for structure. Um, I, I wanted to read something. That's really interesting, and also I want to um, disagree with it a little bit. It was it's by Tom Parada, you know, the novelist. He I don't know where this was. I found it online. Uh, online, he says, like Henry James, Cather is hard to locate on the timeline of American literature, but for, for precisely the opposite reason. James was a 19th century writer who seems to belong to the 20th. In his work, he's always looking forward, anticipating the modernist revolution that arrived around the time of his death. Cather is a 20th century writer, a contemporary of Hemingway, Faulkner, and Fitzgerald, which she isn't quite, but almost, who seems to belong to the 19th. She's always looking in the wrong direction, gazing backward at her hardscrabble pioneer childhood, romanticizing a vanished past. In reality, she was a sophisticated professional woman, a true feminist pioneer, one of the most distinguished magazine editors of her time, and a master stylist who did as much as Hemingway to strip away the excesses of American prose and to write with a compressed lyrical intensity. Yes. Which is, is sort of is great. And I think, yes, she should be called a feminist, even though she would disavow the, 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 the term. But what I want to um, disagree with is the idea of romanticizing a vanished past, because I think she does something much different with the past. She's, she's sort of discovering it and rediscovering it and bringing it back to life and looking to it to fertilize the present. It's not nostalgia, and there's that great passage in, I think it's Song of the Lark, where Thea goes out into the canyons, and there's this, and it's like prehistoric. It, it, it's been there forever and ever, and this long stream, and, and she writes, there was a continuity of life that reached back into the old time, and then she finds this broken pottery, and she says, what was any art but an effort to make a sheath, a mold? in which to imprison for a moment the shining elusive element which is life itself, life hurrying past us and running away, too strong to stop, too sweet to lose. It's just magnificent. But it's also, don't you, it's sort of an epiphany where she puts herself in, in, a, in, a, in a continuum with these people of the past. And, 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 and it's, I mean, it's not nostalgia. It's something completely different. Yes. Uh, uh, you put your finger on a passage that's of supreme importance to me. Uh, really? That passage yeah. from the Song of the Lord. Yeah. It just seems the definition of all the arts. It to, is. To, it uh, is. It's uh, magnificent. To create, yeah. to create a shape where there was none. Where there wasn't. To create an intelligibility where there was only confusion. Uh, and, uh, and to I, carry the past into the present. And uh, then it, and, yes, and yeah. to make something that lasts. The Anasazi are gone, their yeah. vessels yeah. remain. Yeah. And she sees herself as being immortal. She will write something immortal. Yes. Yeah. Uh, she had an old-fashioned view about uh, what the office of art is. Yeah. 
Um, but you know, I would I would say this that she's she's backward looking and she's uh, a profound innovator. Right. Uh, as well. Yes. She's just never called modernist. She's no. usually called anti-modernist. She is, and yet there are modern elements in her. But for one thing, yeah. the sense of, of carving out an identity. And there's something very of consciousness. I mean, this is what I love about Henry James, where he, his women suddenly have consciousness, you know, the, um, in, in Washington Square. Charlotte. She, Charlotte, when, she saw, when she's finally lost the men in her life, and she suddenly comes into her own, and Isabel, I mean, there's a kind of consciousness that you don't see, a self-conscious consciousness, an identity, a sort of evolving identity that you don't, really don't see until modern fiction, I don't yeah, think. Yeah. And, and she has, and Cather's doing that without calling it that, you know. One, you think? Uh, one reviewer pointed out that uh, uh, well, I think I won't say that. Uh, um, but uh, we'll talk about the review. Well, we'll, we'll talk about the different. Um, one, one, there was one, re not reviewer, but a person on Amazon who described my book as as homophobic. There's a laugh. I've been, I've been uh, homophilic all my life. Uh, what is that supposed to mean? I, Did he cite it? That, that I didn't. That, yeah, I. I I didn't turn them into modern day I mean, lesbians, which is which they weren't. People insist on seeing it through the prism of sexuality today. It's it's ridiculous. Yes. It's a whole different thing. I mean, why can't people see? That? I mean, anyway, that's how. <laughs> it's so annoying. Um, so my Antonia was a leap forward. That was really the first big thing she did. And uh, no, uh, oh. Oh, oh, pioneers. There was a oh, right, right, first right. start. She yeah. used to say, "I have two first novels: oh, really? Alexandra's Bridge." And O Pioneers. Well, Alexandra's Bridge was an attempt at a Jamesian novel. Oh, really? Uh, uh, that uh, uh, she disavowed. Uh -huh. uh, so then there was O Pioneers. Uh, Sarah Orne Jewett had said to her, "You must." Write she was a, a big influence. Talk yes, about that a little yes. bit. Yeah. Sarah Orne Jewett uh, uh, and Cather got to know each other when Cather was living in Boston for a time, and uh, the friendship lasted only 16 months because Jewett died. But. Uh, 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 Sarah Orne Jewett, a wonderful writer, uh, author of The Country of the Pointed Furs, was a great influence uh, on her. And uh, uh, somebody she, she what could... Is, I don't know much about could, I'm a, a, totally ignorant of Sarah Orne Jewett. Just Sarah Orne Jewett wrote about small town life in uh -huh. Maine. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, Henry James was a, was a terrifying uh, monument uh, and uh, a, a a fearsome and defeating kind of influence on her. Sarah Orne Jewett, she could learn from. Uh -huh. And uh, so I think that yeah. uh, uh, Sarah Orne Jewett came to her rescue uh, by saying to her, you must write about the things uh, you know and not borrow the glamour of life in New York and London when what you really uh, should be writing about is life in places like Red Cloud. She she did write about urban. She did write urban novels. The oh yes, that's what Alexander's Bridge is all. It's in New York and oh, really? it's in London. Uh -huh. but she she later said uh, the, the the writer is often tempted to write about places that she, that she wishes she were yeah. she was from. But uh, uh, it was Jewett who said, "Do what I have done. Go 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 to the sources of your experience." And then she died young, I guess. Or Sarah Orne Jewett died in, in late middle age. She was already yes. that old, but then Willa Cather just in, sort of internalized her in some way. Yes, or, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, always very important for her. So then came O, o Pioneers. Then came O Pioneers. That was the Jewett influence one. Yes, yeah. and the, the, that's the story of an illicit love that ends in death. A uh, very powerful second novel. Sometimes second novels are feeble things because the writer has poured so much of herself into the first novel. But the first one wasn't really. That the first one didn't didn't touch the depths of the second. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And so, what is it about? O oh, pioneers. It, well, it tells the story of the building up of a of a f family enterprise, right. bus business enterprise, and. Uh, an illicit passion uh, that causes all hell to break loose. And was it well received? Very. Uh -huh. And uh, Ma Antonia came And, and then, then The Song of the Lark. Oh, The Song of the Lark. Which, which one critic, Randolph Bourne, said should have ended 200 pages before well, you know, it, it is. It does go on. I'm, I will have
have to, I sort of agree with that. But I just love that book. Yes. I love that heroine. She's just, un yes, she's I just do talk too. about Say a little This bit. is the story of Taya Kronborg, yeah. who, who starts out in a little town in Colorado called Moonstone, another iteration of Red Cloud, and becomes uh, the great Wagnerian soprano of her time. And uh, uh, people say Kronborg the way they would have said Schwarzkopf or, or Kallas. Uh, she's known simply by her last name by the end of the book. And she's been drained of all human con uh, content by her artistry and exists only on the stage. She looks young when she's on the stage and then looks shattered uh, when she goes home from these performances. Uh, and uh, it is a, uh, uh, it's, it's this, the story of a woman claiming her genius, and it's the first novel I know of in which marriage, uh, or, uh, courtship and marriage are utterly unimportant. Well, I'll reject it. Well, then they are, early on they are. And he's very attractive, and he's very, the guy is not, a, he's not it doesn't conflict with her career, he's, I mean, he's, he, he supports her. Yes. And, yeah, and she is in love with him. But by the end they say, who marries who is, uh, is of small importance. Yes, that line could not have existed in, th well, think of Jane Austen, think no, of Dickens. No, you had to get married. I mean, you had to. That had to be this the summum bonum, the, the, marriage. The perils know. of the passage from betrothal to marriage are what, uh, yes. what, what novels are. But I think of, uh, think of Natasha in, uh, in War and Peace. Well, also, yeah, and she's allowed to sort of grow not really old, but she looks old. I mean, it's, it's like two people when she's on the stage. She's this fiery. Yes charismatic creature and then back home she's just sort of shrunken and you know yes. and, and you know that too is sort of I because women had to be sort of glamorous to the end and she's a, a she's a Kirsten Flagstad if Flagstad were b born and brought up in an improbable place like yeah, uh, like Colorado yeah, yeah, yeah. shall we uh, open it to the audience uh, oh yeah I guess so I have, okay yes absolutely a question um, so my previous uh, experience with Willa Cather was reading Shadows on the Rock years ago. And what I remember of it was in contrast to My Antonia, which I read in preparation for this, so I'd know a little bit more about her writing. It takes place in Canada, in Quebec, and it seems to take place among, as I recall, French Catholics. What, yeah, so what was the basis for that? you know, subject matter, I guess. Yes, they had gone on, the, they, they built a house for themselves, Edith and uh, Willa did, in, in, on Grand Manan Island uh, in the Bay of Fundy. And uh, uh, in, uh, their journey up, up to Canada each year would take them to Quebec City. And she got, she was captivated by the, uh, the place and decided she wanted to write a novel there, a novel that takes place in the late 17th century. Okay, okay. And uh, it's a very hushed, beautiful book that spans one year in the life of, a, of a, uh, a, um, an apothecary and his daughter. Right, right, thank you for reminding me. Um, I have just one other um, quick question. In researching her a little bit also online, which is very limited, I haven't read your book, but I'm interested now, um, especially, the critique that I, I, you know, the revisionism when she's, I guess, fallen out of favor um, yeah, yes. is really a lot about the, her status as a privileged, you know, the, the, particularly the status of the protagonist in My Antonia as a privileged white, fairly well-to-do young man who's glamorizing this kind of life of people back then. And I think this falls a little bit into the same category that we were talking about using the modern prism to look at her sexuality or to look at the, using the modern pr prism to even look at her feminism. It sort of seems to be the same thing when you're looking at this idea that she couldn't recognize the suffering that the workers would have had to have you know, undertaken in that environment. Mm. You know, there's another thing. She, she, she's deeply interested in the Anasazi, uh, who are uh, 12th and 13th century, 11th, 12th, 13th century Americans, 
uh, uh, living in the Four Corners area in the Southwest. But she had no interest in the Native American populations who, uh, uh, who, who pop, pop, who were still around. Yes, it's, that's true. I'm glad you brought up um, Shadows on the Rock because that was my introduction to Willa Cather. My mother gave me her copy when I was about as old as you were when you first read My Antonia. And I, I was so struck by it. Um, and actually, that novel and Death Comes to the Archbishop are arguably maybe my two favorite Cather novels. And I, which is so odd because they're very out of what for her was the present. They are, she's really imagining herself into a very different time, a very different kind of person. And I wondered if you'd talk a little bit about her urge to do that and, and how successfully you think she managed it. I think that she, did, she didn't want to repeat herself. She, she was always in quest of new material and a new perspective. And when you, when you read the novels end to end, when you, when you really go through the corpus of her work, you see a, uh, uh, an extraordinary versatility of impulse in, in, in the books. And uh, uh, I mean, there's a kind of writer who writes the same book over and over again. Uh, Hermione Lee is currently writing a biography of Anita Bruckner. Now, Anita Bruckner wrote the same book over and over again. <laughs> well, yeah, she did. You could say Jane Austen wrote, in certain respects, the same book over and over again. But Cather was always uh, in quest of a new perspective. So, for instance, she writes, in My Mortal Enemy, she writes a, uh, a little novel that takes place in New York and then in S San Francisco. Uh, she was determined not to uh, uh, go over trodden ground again. Uh, she was, yeah, she was always in quest of some novelty for, in the elements of, the, of what she was creating. Then you say something wonderful about that. Let me just quote it. She, about Death Comes to the Archbishop. She'd found a medieval method for telling a 19th century story and preferred to call the book a narrative rather than a novel. Uh, yes. How, what do you mean exactly? I love that. But. Um, yeah, uh, in Death Comes to the Archbishop, there are all these, it's a series of interpolated tales uh, and they they are give shape to the uh, uh, to the novel, uh, and uh, these are uh, it's a it's a I don't know about medieval now that now that you read that, uh, but I think it's derived from Don Quixote. It's derived from Smollett. Uh, uh, the the well, and the, actually, in, the, the Archbishop was actually a real semi a, a real, real person. Oh, sure, a real in, person in New Fa Mexico. Father Lamy. Yes, exactly. Thanks, Amanda. And uh, the, you know, you should, we should say about, about Death Comes for the Archbishop that it's about a great friendship between men who are very often apart, a great love between people of the same sex with no hint of sexuality uh, at, at all, but they are uh, probable saints, the two of them. That's true of the professor's house as well, isn't it? I mean, that relationship. Between Tom Outland and yeah, the, professor. the professor, yeah, yes, uh, uh, above sex, yeah, yeah, uh, like the relations between the two, the two priests. Did she ever write about any intense relationships between women that way? Oh, uh, let me think. No, I guess she, she didn't. Most of her and, and her narrators are often men. I mean, my Antonia being the first example. Yes. Uh, I mean, she has that androgynous. She is androgynous, but she, the male, she really identifies. Strongly, strongly with the male. With the male. She, she yeah. identifies strongly with Jim Burden, for example. Yeah. And uh, uh, the premise of my entity is that these two people meet on a train, and they are going to. They decide that they're both going to write about a girl, an extraordinary, magnetic, charismatic immigrant girl they remember. Antonia Shimerda, and uh, uh, Willa, the with, Willa Cather of the preface hems and haws and procrastinates while Jim goes ahead and writes the book you, you read. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. Yes? Uh, yeah, I grew up in North Dakota and in the ninth grade we had to read my Antonia, Mr. Kraft's class. 
Um, and I still remember after all these years, you know, it was, it was kind of thrilling to read about uh, the place that I had grown up or a place similar to it. But there was also this strong impression, which I still carry this day of that, that I couldn't have articulated it then, but like this was an artist. This was an encounter of a, of a great artist dealing with a landscape and people that were familiar with me. And, and I just found that so remarkable about, about, about you, her. You, you know, she's, she's... That would have been a fantastic experience. Jim, yeah. Jim Burden says, look, he lifts the, the, the tarp of the wagon and looks out and at what he says is no landscape at all, just the raw materials from which a landscape was made. I was going to allude to that because yeah. as a child, I remember many long car trips looking out the window thinking, yes. what is it about this land that... <laughs> disturbs me or depresses me. And as soon as I read that in the ninth grade, I thought, zing, yeah. you know, that is exactly right. Okay. And so my question is, for all her other accomplishments, do you think that Willa Cather knew that if nothing else, she had nailed the, 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 the prairie experience or the experience of those people and had really, you know, made a contribution to American yeah. literature yes. that no one really else uh, I think could have? Goes, there are certain writers who are quite lucky in that they get someplace first and bring the news. And she had, she has pride of place among uh, uh, Western r American writers, just in the way that John Cheever got to the suburbs when they were still new and, and reported on them like no one else ever has. So another of my very favorite writers. Well, you have a wonderful line about the professor's house, and maybe this is also, she gets to this before anybody else. She, you say that the professor's house is a campus novel like no other. There weren't any campus oh. novels yet, were uh, there? Yes, no, that, uh, <laughs> she was leading the way. <laughs> Talk there's, about it in those terms. Well, I mean, now we have Stoner, and yeah, there's, yeah. there were once very famous books from a generation ago, uh, Randall Jarrell's Pictures from an Institution, and Mary McCarthy's The Groves of Academe, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, yes, Willa was in the van. She wrote a campus novel before there were any others, and it is like no other. They, I mean, the, the professor and Tom Outland go off together. Now, all these books were uh, embargoed from being made into movies uh, by the terms of Willa's will, but they're coming out of copyright now, and wouldn't, uh, wouldn't the professor's house make a dandy movie? Oh, yeah, it would. Uh, and with, uh, with the, the role of Tom Outland for some y uh, handsome young actor. Oh, there are a lot of those around. I, I have several in mind. <laughs> <laughs> and who's going to play the professor? We have to think about that. Tom Out but the professor and Tom Outland go off to, and spend the summer in the Mesa together. <laughs> and Roddy Doyle and uh, 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 Tom spend the summer in the Mesa. And everybody would force sort of more homoerotic tone notes on it than it yes. would warrant, I think, maybe. Yes, it's uh, with the best will in the world. I mean, I mean, I'm always delighted to see homosexuality in a book, but I just don't find it in uh, the professor's house. I mean, it's very underground. Whatever's there is just completely submerged. I mean, yes. the eros is not, does not figure in it. She has, she has these anti-erotic. Yeah. Portraits. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Talk about that. Well, I, uh, uh, I, I'm all for it. My, my, my students write about sex as if it were the only th yeah. thing. There are lives in which there's very little to no sex, and I think uh, those interested will a great deal. The two magnificent saintly priests of uh, death comes for the archbishop, and and uh, uh, the relations uh, between. Tom and the professor, the supreme examples of anti eros. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, some years back, I visited uh, Willa Cather's gravesite in Jaffrey, New Hampshire. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, um, Where is it? Jaffrey, New Hampshire. Yeah. And the recollection I took from it uh, was the placement of, of her grave, which, as I recall, was way off in the corner of the graveyard. And, and even her headstone was turned away from the rest of the people whose remains had been buried there. And I'm really interested to know, are there any stories about 
why? Yes. Why is she there in particular? And, and, and why is it oriented the way that it is? I, I, I can't speak much about the orientation of the stone, except to say that that was her choice of a place to be buried, and she wanted to be within view of Mount Monadnock. Ah, okay. Okay. because it is facing the mountain rather than... Facing the mountain. The, the, rather than it, facing the community. There's a big stone that says gather, and uh, uh, that is happiness to be dissolved in something great. Uh, it's the, the, uh, the line of hers. And, uh, and there, uh, there is uh, what looks to be the, gra the little s stone for Edith at the foot of the grave. But in fact, e Edith and Willa, I've learned this since publishing the book, Willa and e Edith are lying side by side. Uh, in the grave, but the, the stone just says, will it gather? Well, talk about the importance of that place to them. They had moved... They yes, it was because the, uh, the Jaffrey Inn was so welcoming, uh, and they, she would go there and write. Uh, she had her, her own private Yaddo, her own private McDowell. Uh, she didn't like those places when she visited them. Oh, really? No. Uh, uh, she was a little, a little too grand for... The, uh -huh. Her, um, she thought it was kids' stuff. Maybe it is. Um, and uh, uh, at the, uh, the Jaffrey Inn, they would give her a third-floor room where she, uh, uh, where she did a lot of her writing. So that was the that was a landscape she loved, and and uh, uh, particularly Monadnock, uh, very important to her. Yes. I, I wrote this book during the pandemic when travel was impossible. I had to do all that traveling in my mind, but I was in close touch with people in all those places who answered my questions. You, you may have addressed uh, some of this, but I was wondering, did she travel much abroad? And uh, also, uh, could you talk a little bit about her family background? I was interested that they were Baptists and then she was drawn to the Episcopal yeah. Church. And just just what kind of uh, world did she grow up in, in in Nebraska? What was the first question I didn't oh, hear? If, if she traveled much abroad. Oh, yes. Uh, 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 to first. England, but particularly to, uh, to France. And, and Venice was important to her. Uh, but France and southern France in particular, and Paris. She went to Paris to do research for uh, Shadows on the Rock, as a matter of fact. Uh, the family story is interesting. Uh, uh, the, the Cathars were Southerners, Virginians, who had come down in the world after the Civil War and decided to try their fortunes out west. And one, but, part, one, one was a Unionist and one was a Second. Oh, oh yes, yeah, she, had, she had both Unionist and Confederate uh, forebears. That's true. Uh, and uh, um, I found this to be a pattern. The more you look around, the more you find it. Uh, a family goes down and down socially, down and down, and then at the very last gasp, out pops a writer who, <laughs> who, can, who can tell the whole story. That's the story of the Cheevers, and that's the story of Catherine Ann Porter's forebears. Uh, the more you look, the more you find this story. Great. That's good. One more. Oh sure, uh, 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 there's a mag It's all online, it's so it, it's very easy uh, to to go. Both the Willa Gather Center in Red Cloud and the University of Nebraska uh, at Lincoln. Uh, I was in constant touch with them, and they they made the book possible. Those archivists, yes. Well, Benjamin, Molly, thank you very much. That was terrific. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, and I also thank you all for the great, thank you, Ben, and I also want to thank um, Shelby White and the Levy Foundation for sponsoring this event. So.